Well, good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad that you are joining us today. And I want to begin this service with an important reminder that while there is so much going on in the world that is wrong, and before you start to fill in the blank with what you feel wrong is, I want to remind you that our Savior, the one we come to worship today, the one to learn from today, that Jesus liked people who were nothing like him, and they liked him back. And Jesus calls us to love other people the same way that he loved us. And as followers of Jesus, we have a specific definition of love in case you forgot how we as Christians are to act in love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. In the last couple of days, I've been reflecting on this and asking myself, am I these things to people? Am I evidence of love to people who are nothing like me in my neighborhood, in my community, in my city, on social media, in the world? Am I hiding this love under a basket or am I letting this love shine so that others can see it? And the truth is, is I know that we have a long ways to go. And that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm sitting and watching myself and preaching to myself today. Because the world is in desperate need of a Savior. But for us, we don't have an excuse because we know our Savior. And we know what Jesus has called us to do. So today is also Communion Sunday, where we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And I want to remind you, that if you would like to celebrate the Lord's Supper at home today, that at the end of the service, I will be leading us. And I would encourage you to have some type of bread or cracker and something to drink to remember the sacrifice of Jesus and that we are to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. But when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's an important time to reflect and confess to our Heavenly Father for the sins of commission and omission, and to remember that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. So let us begin this morning's service. Good morning, Westminster Presbyterian Church family. My name is Daniel, and I am the new youth director here at WPC. And I am Becca Geving, the children's ministry coordinator. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. The reading comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us worship God. Oh 
A couple of quick announcements for today. First of all, I want to remind you that all of our regular online programs and announcements will be listed at the end of the service. But the best way to be informed of everything at the church is to sign up for our weekly email newsletter. You can simply sign up by going to our website and clicking contact at the top of the page. There, you can also find information about joining a home group 
which I highly recommend that you do. Also, you can find out how to continue to be giving online or by mailing a check into the church office, as well as all of the programs happening at the church. But one opportunity that I want to highlight is a call to prayer. Now this morning, if you received that weekly email, you received a link to an online call to prayer. Because all of the events that are going on in the world, I am asking you to participate with me in this prayer. If you didn't receive the email, we have also posted this call to prayer on our website. But I would encourage you to pray through this card throughout the day and the week. Take this card with you on a walk and pray while you walk through your neighborhood. Pray for those things in your home as a family or even by yourself. Maybe take a drive and pray for these things. Of course, don't read the card while you're driving, but pray while you drive. Turn off the radio. Pray for protesters. Pray for police. Pray for our officials. Pray for our governments. For those who are mourning, unemployed, struggling. Pray boldly that God would use you to bring light and grace and life and mercy Pray for miracles, for justice, and to be part of the solution. So I hope you'll join me by downloading that card or keeping it on your phone, taking it with you, and engaging in this call to prayer. But let's now continue in our service together. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad we get to worship God. Uh, every day is a good day to worship God. This has been an incredibly sad week for our country. And many times this week I thought, I, I just don't have the words to express. Um, and I've heard other people say that too. So you might be feeling that way this morning. And um, God knows our deepest longings and the words that we can't even express. Um, Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So with that in mind, even when we can't find the exact words, we can come to God in prayer. And so we can join our hearts and our minds together by the power of the Holy Spirit, quiet ourselves before God and pray. Please join me. We praise your name together, God. You are the mighty one in charge of all things, seen and unseen. We praise you as our creator, God, the creator of each human life, each precious life that you love equally. We acknowledge, Lord, that, that we need you. We ask that you would search our hearts. Forgive us for the ways that we are not surrendering our lives and our will to you. Forgive us for the ways we have not valued all human life as created in your image. Forgive us for the ways we have not sought your justice or your guidance. And here are silent prayers of personal confession. Lord, we thank you for meeting us in our weakness. We thank you for the sure promise we have that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive. Lord, would you build us up to be your body on earth, a body that shares love and hope with all people in our lives, in our communities, and throughout the world. We are brokenhearted for our country and our world right now. 
We do not know what we ought to pray. So we ask, Lord, that your spirit would intercede for us, for our world. Holy Spirit, intercede for your people in accordance with your will, God. We believe, God, that you are a God of miracles, of signs, of wonders. And we ask that you would move in us and in our country as only you can. And so we pray now. God, would you bring comfort to the family of George Floyd? We ask that you would bring comfort and hope to all who have suffered injustice and loss. Lord, bring your healing across racial and political divides. Protect those seeking peace. Lord, we ask that you would allow and cause compassion to increase. We pray, Lord, that all who call on the name of Jesus would be emboldened by your spirit, Lord, to seek unity and justice. that we might yield to the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would use us to reach out in love. We pray for wholeness, for healing, for those struggling physically and emotionally. We ask for your strength as they persevere. And we thank you, Jesus, that you know the depth of all human pain. We thank you for choosing to identify with us in our pain. And we thank you, Lord, and trust in your victorious power, your resurrection power, your love that endures and will win. We trust, Lord, in your goodness and your power. And we pray together as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today, we are beginning a brand new sermon series called, How Then Should We Live? Also, it's subtitled, The Essential Do-Nots of Jesus, which is partly from, in, in response to the last sermon series that we just finished called, Tough as Nails. And if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to go to our website and watch that series so that you can 
know where we're coming from. Anyways, because I'm a pastor, and this might sound a little odd to some of you, but I have some hobbies and habits that you might not have. But lately, one of those hobbies that I have has been reading blogs and listening to people who have abandoned the Christian faith. I've watched YouTube videos and read articles uh, that people have written on why they left. And it's so fascinating to me as to why some people stop being a Christian. Because from my perspective, following Jesus makes your life better. And following Jesus makes you better at life. And everyone I have met wants their life to be better. And most people want to be better at life. So I'm so intrigued by people who were raised in the church or somehow they became a Christian and then stopped or bailed out. And I'll admit that my experience is limited to only what I have seen or read or heard. But of those that I have looked at, almost all of them have left for some really bad reasons. Some of them will say they didn't like the Christians that they met. Some of them were really quirky or weird Christians. Or maybe their parents were kind of weird. Maybe they were raised a certain way and so they left Jesus. That's a bad reason to leave Jesus. And you know, you have at one time in your life had a bad haircut. And you just went out and found a different barber or a different stylist or a different salon. You didn't give up on haircutting. And some of you have even had a bad medical experience. And you just went out and found a new doctor. But you didn't give up on doctors, hospitals, and medicine. So, in the same way, you shouldn't give up on Jesus just because some Christians, or maybe even one Christian, who didn't say the right thing or answer your question the right way or was quirky or maybe even a little bit weird. That's a bad reason. Now the other and maybe a more common reason people give up on Christianity or Jesus is because of the Bible. And this happens pretty frequently. And it isn't a good reason either in my opinion. Now I'll watch debates and apologists online and people will repeatedly give the same questions and answers over and over. Now here are the common ones that I hear. Well, I just can't believe in a six-day creation. I believe in science, or I used to believe that when I was a kid, and then I went to college. Another one I hear is, I just can't believe in a good God that he would allow and sanction genocide in the Old Testament. I just can't follow a God who would allow that. Or, you know, there is this historical evidence, there is no historical evidence, that the Israelites actually left Egypt. Or there's this date in the New Testament that doesn't line up with other historical documents, so I just left Christianity. And this might sound offensive, but those aren't good reasons to leave Christianity, to stop being a Christian. And many of you, you know this about me. I think that the church needs to do the best possible job of helping people have a rock-solid faith. And the truth is, is this is where maybe we've messed up a little. Now, this is important that you follow me on this one. But the Bible is not the foundation of our faith. Now, don't panic. The foundation of our faith, and if you've been in one of our confirmation classes this last year, or even remember a sermon series we did a while ago, the foundation of our faith is an event. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an event that took place long before the New Testament was written. In fact, the reason the New Testament was written was because of the event of the resurrection. There wouldn't be a New Testament if there was no resurrection. And if you have been a Christian for a while, and this is sometimes really hard, but when the Bible was put in our hands as one book, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they were both given equal theological weight. But we know it has different theological practice. 
And you probably understand the struggle here because at one time in your life, maybe someone has asked you, hey, you're a Christian, right? And you're like, yeah. And they say, well, doesn't the Bible teach or say that? And what they do is they reference some Old Testament passage. And you usually respond with, well, yeah, it does say that, but we don't do that. Well, why? Isn't it all inspired? Well, yeah, but I don't know. You know what? Don't ask me any more of those hard questions. I got to go, okay? And you understand that tension, right? There's some things that are just hard to bring up and talk about. But here's the thing. We aren't the first ones to have to deal with that tension. In fact, today as we start this new sermon series, we're going to go back to the very first church business meeting. Now, some of you have been to church business meetings before, and they tend to either be a little bit boring or really exciting, right? But this one we're going to look at today was very, very exciting. And the decisions that were made there and all the way back then still impact you and I today. So first, let's go back to right after Jesus had been raised from the dead. This was a total surprise to everyone. Nobody expected Jesus to be raised from the dead. Nobody. They all expected Jesus to do what dead people do. Stay dead. But now there's this chaos and pandemonium. People are on the streets of Jerusalem and they're saying, I know I used to be a coward or act cowardly, but I had a conversation with the risen Savior Jesus. And thousands of people in Jerusalem are becoming Christians. And this is fascinating. A group of Jewish theologians realize, oh no, we missed it. We should have seen this coming. So they dive back into the Old Testament and start looking for Jesus. And you know what? They see the coming Messiah everywhere in the Old Testament. And they're like, how did we miss it? We're the professionals and we missed it. And they see it. They see the coming Messiah will suffer. Gosh, we never saw that. It says right here that where he would even come from. And this is when you read the Gospel of Matthew, that all throughout Matthew, there are references to the Old Testament. Jesus was fulfilling all of these things. So while this group of people are digging deeper and deeper, another group says, okay, you do this, we're going to go get the message out to everyone, including the Gentiles. Now this is where you come in, because I'm going to guess that at least 95% and maybe more, maybe 98% of you are Gentiles, which means you are not Jewish. And if we were all suddenly first century Gentiles, our mindset changes about God and gods. The gods toyed with people and people tried to manipulate the gods. That was the pagan religion. And all of a sudden, these small groups and maybe one or two people start to show up, and Christianity was introduced to us Gentiles as something brand new that God had done in the world. And guess what? Not a single Gentile became a Christian because the Bible says so. Because there was no Bible then. There was no New Testament. There was just the Hebrew Scriptures, which Most Gentiles didn't take seriously because it was a Jewish book and didn't apply to them. But you're telling me that a guy rose from the dead and that I could go to Jerusalem right now, today, and talk to those people who saw him die, they saw him buried, and then later saw him alive and talked with him, and he will take away my sin? I want to hear more about that. And that's all the first century Gentiles had. They had the gospel, the eyewitness accounts or the eyewitness eyewitnesses and the teachings of Jesus according to the eyewitnesses. And that was it. This is why when Paul wrote his letter to the church in Corinth, he writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you 
which you received and on which you have taken your stand. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me, also to, uh, as to one abnormally born. And that was the gospel. That was all that they had. And let's face it, that isn't really a lot to go on. And then the people who shared the gospel with the Gentiles said, and guess what? This one single God has invited you. And this is brand new. He has invited you to approach him as your heavenly father. And this was brand new. It was an intimate. It was personal. And the Gentiles began to flock to the gospel. They believed and were convinced that Jesus had rose from the dead, not too far away from where they lived, and that he would take away their sin and save them. And the next thoughts came quickly. Okay, so Jesus rose from the dead. I'm now a Christian. Now what? How then should we live? Now, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, you've got all these theologians and thinkers who have found Jesus in the Old Testament. And oh my goodness, there were hints of Jesus everywhere. How did we miss this? And their thinking goes like this. So Jesus was Jewish. The Jewish nation birthed the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And all these Gentiles are now embracing Jesus as the Messiah. Well, it just makes sense. They all need to become Jewish. So in a document in the New Testament, there is a book called Acts. Now remember, the events happened first, then they were written down, then they were included in the New Testament and the Bible. This is important. There is no Bible when the first church meeting took place. Now you can find this in the book of Acts chapter 15. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. And now this is about 300 miles away. So this is not just a day trip. It could have taken weeks. And they were teaching the believers. These were the new Gentile believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And you can imagine a murmur or a groan. What? And this is what's going to be decided at the Jerusalem Council. They're going to decide if every man who becomes a Christian has to have surgery. And could you imagine what this would have done to the Billy Graham crusade? What about summer camp? When uh, it would be like this, getting a phone call from your son. Hey mom, guess what? Last night I accepted Jesus and I became a Christian. Now Jesus is my savior. And now the camp wants to know about our medical coverage. Yikes. Talk about awkward. But you can understand the idea. Look, we found Jesus in the Old Testament. He is Jewish, and we are Jewish, and you too should become Jewish. Now, all the men in Antioch are like, let's pray for the Jerusalem Council, okay? Everybody, pray, 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 pray. Let's pray it goes well. Verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. And Paul hasn't started writing any of these letters yet. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. This is a big meeting. You have Peter and Andrew, Matthew's there, John's there. And they're all asking the question, do we have to become Jewish in order to become Jesus followers? Now, when Paul and Barnabas came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported 
everything that God had done through them. They're like, guys, you are going to love this. I've been to Corinth. I've been to Galatia, all over these provinces. I've been all around, and as I preach the gospel, the Gentiles, yes, the Gentiles are giving up their pagan gods, idol worship, and they are embracing Jesus as Savior. And everyone is thrilled. Now, this next part is so cool. And if you aren't a Christian, or if you once were a Christian and walked away, this is so important. Then, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up. Pause. Are you telling me that in this meeting, some of the leaders of the first century church are Pharisees? You mean the Pharisees are now Jesus followers and believers? The ones that when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Pharisees are like those bad guys that show up? The ones who were behind having Jesus crucified? The ones who ganged up on Jesus? In the book of Acts, the Pharisees are now leaders of the church. And how in the world did that happen? Was it because of what Jesus taught? Was it because of the miracles? No. Was it because he was crucified? Nope. There's only one explanation as to why the Pharisees joined the church and proclaimed Jesus as their Savior. And it's because he rose from the dead. And I can imagine them showing up with their heads hung low in shame, saying, we are so ashamed of ourselves. We have come to apologize. We crucified the Son of Man. And do you know how the first century believers, you know what they did to these guys? You know how he treated them? They welcomed them. Wow. They welcomed the very ones who were responsible for crucifying Jesus. And they believed because they saw and believed the eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. Okay, we got to keep going, but I think that is so awesome. So they stand up, and you know they love the law, and now Jesus. And they say, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses, which is the point of this entire meeting. Verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up, right? Now, in the early days of the church, there were two main guys. One of them was Peter. And the other was another guy that we'll get to in a second. But Peter has become the leader of the church. And he stands up and he says, Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Because five chapters earlier, God had told Peter to go to Cornelius' house. And you have that super awkward moment where Peter tells God, no, 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 I'm not going into a Gentile's house. We aren't supposed to be with them. And God says, go and eat with them. And Peter's all worried about getting like Gentile cooties or something, right? But he goes. And Peter's like, and I shared the gospel with them. And they believed that the Gentiles are to believe and be saved, just as we have. And he is kind of shaking his finger a little bit here. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Look, You've been on the wrong side once before. Don't do it again. And this was so significant. Because what was at stake here impacts us, you and I. The temple system of sacrifice, the burden of the law, the 600 laws. How has that been working for you? Peter might have asked. And this is awesome. Peter sits down and there is silence. And then later, this is one of my favorite parts. Then James spoke up. James, 
the brother of Jesus. And you need to know this, that James shows up to this gospel party late, like the Pharisees who now believe. See, James, his sisters and mother, they all thought Jesus was acting a little bit crazy at times. But then, after the resurrection of Jesus, James believes. He's a believer and a follower of his brother. He stands up and says, Brothers, listen to me. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead of having the Gentiles follow the 600 laws, instead of having Gentiles undergo the knife to be saved, here is what we should write to them and tell them. And this is important. This is us. And this is going to mess with some of you. This, and this letter will explain how you, as a Gentile Christian, are to view the law of Moses, the Torah. And here's the letter. They write, Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us, from Jerusalem, without our authorization, and disturbed you. In other words, you were beginning to follow Jesus, and then some people came from Jerusalem with all these new rules, and they were troubling your minds by what they said. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden with you with anything beyond the following requirements. Now, this is mind-boggling. The whole conversation was, do we keep the 600 plus laws? And here is what James says. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, okay, check, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and sexual immorality. And you can read this, but you find out the reason these dietary laws are mentioned in all of these is, is because they're all in all these cities, there are Jewish people around. And then in order to have these groups meet together, be sensitive to your Jewish brothers and sisters, and then abstain from sexual immorality. And you wanna know what else is on the list? Here's the rest of the letter. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. And that's it. That's all they write. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. Verse 31 says, the people read it and were glad and for its encouraging message. And I can bet they were. Whew, that was close. Now let me just finish with this. Your faith was at stake right there. Historically, the Jesus movement came that close to stalling out. And the reason why is if the first church meeting had decided to have all of us to become Jewish, to be saved, to become Christian, then Christianity would have died in AD 70. Because when the Roman Empire destroyed the temple, ancient Judaism ceased to exist. They can no longer sacrifice, and it has been that way ever since. But now the first century Christians are left thinking, that still isn't much to go on. So you have these Gentile Christians with no Bible, these three activities to abstain from, the apostles teaching about what the gospel is, and what the eyewitnesses share about what Jesus taught. So now this is where we get the question, how then shall we live? The essential do nots of Jesus. So tune in next week as we dive into them. Now one last thing. The apostles, the church leaders, the key teaching or piece of theology that kept this going was that we were saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And so we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in just a minute, we're going to invite you to have some time in your home celebrating the Lord's Supper and remembering that it is the grace of Jesus Christ, the mercy and the sacrifice that he gives to us, that is how we are saved. Enjoy the Lord's Supper. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, we are so thankful for the grace that is poured out upon each one of us. Lord, as we come before you today and have just celebrated the Lord's Supper and remember your sacrifice, Lord, as we remember what you did for each one of us to forgive us our sins, Lord, we also remember that it is a call to follow you. Lord, that we are to pick up our cross and to follow you. Sometimes saying no to our own will for your will. Lord, sometimes following you when it doesn't feel quite right in our own lives, but it is right from your eyes. So Heavenly Father, be with us this day. Help us know how to live. Lord, let us remember what it is that you taught us so that we can follow you and be Christians in this world. We thank you for this time, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray.